All right, we're going to be in John chapter 11 this morning. Uh, again, it's a blessing having everybody here. Hope you're doing well. Praise God. Glad to see that people are still showing up to the house of the Lord. Amen. We're not in California. Praise God. They shut one. They shut that old boy down. They told him he can't have church, man. Lord, help us. Word of God says for us not to forsake the gathering of the brethren. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm, I'm preaching to you this morning. I don't really know. I mean, I know how this title came about, but it doesn't completely go along with the with, with what we're going to read. So just bear with me because we're going to but the Lord's going to unfold it and he's going to expose what we're trying to say this morning. But the title of my message is identify yourself. There's a lot of different ways that that can be taken. And as we go through, we'll pray that the Lord reveals it to us. But that's the word this morning. Identify yourself, child of God. Amen. John chapter 11. And we're going to be skipping around a little bit. But let's start with verses 1 through 4. It says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And listen, you know, I, I don't want to stop at every little sentence and phrase and start preaching right away, but I just want to make a point that, listen, whatever you're going through that looks like it might be some type of a sickness in your life, and I'm not talking about physical illnesses or whatever the case, but whatever it is, the trial that's in your life, you need to understand something. God's intent is not for it to result in death, but instead God's intent is that he allows these things to take place so that we'll put our focus and our eyes on the Lord, amen, and that the Lord would be able to show up and turn that thing around and to bring glory unto God. Do you know that that is your purpose on life, on earth? Amen. See, it's important that we understand that, and we're going to identify who we are supposed to be before this is over with, but it's important that you and I understand that the end game for God is that He would be glorified. Some people will sit back and they'll say, well, I don't understand. What, is he a narcissist? That's just a big old word for being egocentric or wanting all the focus to be on him. Is he, but God's God, amen, and he created this earth, and he is worthy to be glorified. Hallelujah. And when it's all said and done, that's his purpose for your life. His purpose for your life is that you would be a vessel, amen, where he can receive glory. Praise God. And so here we have the story of Lazarus. God said this sickness is not unto death, but that instead God would be glorified. And so let's go ahead and skip down to verse 11 through 15. These things said he, and after that he says unto them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. So now Jesus is, he's heard news of Lazarus and he's talking to his disciples. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes. This is an interesting thought right here that the Lord's saying. He says, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. Why? To the intent that you may believe, nevertheless, let us go, go to him. What Jesus is saying is, had I been there, had I stopped the progression of what was going to take place, it might have actually thwarted your increase or your growth in the faith. And so I'm glad that I wasn't there to stop this disease process. I'm glad I wasn't there because Jesus knows what's about to happen. <laughs> Jesus knows what's about to go down. When he shows up on the scene, he knows that death is going to give way to life because that's what happens. Amen. Amen. Child of God, you need to understand that. You need to believe that. And if nothing else, I know I'm never, the Lord never called me to be a cheerleader. But I got to tell you this morning, good news, good news. 
That no matter what you're going through, no matter how bleak the situation looks, no matter how dark it is, God does not intend for this thing to result in death to your life. Amen. And listen, physical death is just a state. When you breathe your last breath here, you breathe your first breath there. You're on streets of gold. You're in glory with the Lord. That is your purpose for to be an eternal child of God. Amen. Amen. And so what I'm here to tell you about this morning, though, is this, is that God doesn't want you spiritually dead. God wants you to Amen. be awakened. God wants to bring rest resurrection of life to you. Hallelujah. So this is your walk for God. Amen. Amen. So I'm glad I wasn't there because if I would have stopped this, you, you just continued on thinking everything was okay. But you're about to see something. You're about to see me do something. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and go down to verse 16. We're going to read 16 through 27. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, which means twin, Unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, Thomas doesn't understand what's going on. And we've given Thomas a bad rap many a time, you know, for being the doubter, right? But what Thomas, even though Thomas doesn't understand what's going on right here, he's like, well, if Jesus says it's a good thing that Lazarus died, maybe we should die too. Well, you will die, Thomas. <laughs> I mean, in more ways than one. Because, see, the gospel talks of death, and we're going to talk about that this morning. The gospel talks about death in Christ. But at the same time, Thomas was one that we could call him the doubter all day long. Unless he, unless I, I could put my finger in the hole in his hand, I will not believe. Okay, well, here you go, Thomas. Go ahead, stick your finger in here. Thrust your hand in my side. You know, blessed are you, but what about those that cannot see and yet still will believe? But at the same time, we got to be careful. We don't want to give Thomas too hard of a time. Because church history tells us that Thomas went to India. And he began to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in a foreign land in India. And they didn't like his message too much over there. They didn't like the fact that he was telling them that their plethora of gods were false gods. And that there was only one way unto the Father and that that had to come through Jesus Christ. And they said, you need to change your message. You need to quit talking about the resurrection. But Thomas refused. He said, I'm not a doubter anymore. Hallelujah. Because he showed up in my life and he allowed me to stick my finger in that hand. He allowed me to thrust my hand in his side and I will not recant. And guess what they did? They took a sword and they ran him through. And it killed him. So we need to be careful that we don't give Thomas too hard of a time because you know what? I haven't lost blood for Jesus yet. Lord, help Amen. us. Amen. I don't know where this world's going, church. And I, you know, but I got to keep on reminding that my message doesn't have anything to do with the end of the world this morning. But I got, I feel an urgency in my heart. I'm not trying to tell you that we are dead. And that's not what I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you that things are changing rapidly. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that like no other time before. Living the American dream may not be like what we were raised up in. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that just because you're an American does not mean that you will never face trial, tribulation, chaos, circumstance. But I'm here to tell you that no matter what you face upon this earth, see, Jesus already warned us. He already prepared us. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So no matter what you're facing, the answer is still the same. Yes, Lord. The Father sent a prescription, hallelujah, to heal the land, to heal the heart, and his name is Jesus. Amen. And as long as he's got breath in my lungs and a mouth I can speak with, I will keep exalting the name of Jesus by his grace, because that is what he's called the preacher to do. Amen. Not to exalt himself, not to get up here and, and have a me show. No, this is about Jesus. He's the Holy One. He's the righteous one. And he's the one that deserves all the glory and the honor. Let's exalt him. Amen. Yes, Amen. So there's Thomas. He said, let's go that we might die with him. I don't exactly know what it means, but it's got to be good if it's good for Lazarus. Now, now, I want you to notice this because we're about to get into it here in a little bit. But I want you to see this. Bethany was near to Jerusalem. They just put that in there. I mean, Jesus wasn't in Jerusalem at the time. It's just kind of giving us a location of where Bethany was because there was two Bethanies and one of them was close to Jerusalem. All right. It's about 15 furlongs, which is about 1.8 miles. So Bethany was about 1.8 miles away. Now, it is interesting when you read the life of Jesus or the last days of Jesus that last week. That he kept, it seems like he kept going back and forth from Jerusalem back to Lazarus' house. Jerusalem back to Lazarus' house. About 1.8 miles. He was sleeping in Bethany and then he'd go to Jerusalem and he'd do some teaching. He'd rebuke the Pharisees. And then he'd come back the next day, rode in, finally rode in on a donkey and that's when he was betrayed, right? 
So it says right here that now Bethany was near to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs, and many of the Jews, uh, sorry, I lost my place there. Many of, the, many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house and then said, Martha, unto Jesus, Lord, if you hadn't been here. You know, one thing, I don't know that it's real important to the context of the story, but I didn't include it. Is that when we said, and after these things, he said unto his disciples, he said, let us go and for Lazarus is sleeping. Well, some of the things that he said was when he told them at first that he was going to go to Judea, which is the southern part of Israel where Jerusalem is located, his disciples said, well, the Jews have wanted to stone you recently. You're going to go back over there? And then Jesus begins to tell them, listen, it, it's still daylight. And whenever it's daylight, it's, I'm paraphrasing, whenever it's daylight, it's going to be okay. When you walk in the light, you're going to be okay. But when you walk in the dark, then, then it's not safe. And his point was, is this, is that as long as you and I are walking according to God's will, no matter how bad it looks out there, listen to me, you can fly and land into the Middle East right now and start preaching Jesus. And if it was God's will for you to do that, then you're going to be okay until the appointed time. It doesn't mean that nobody's ever going to have to give up their life for Christ. People don't like that kind of preaching, but that's just reality. That's church history right there. But what I will tell you is, is that if God's got a purpose for your life and he has anointed you and appointed you in order to accomplish that, that, that purpose for him, then that his will will be done. And there ain't no devil in hell. Amen. Ain't, there's no government authority that's going to be able to stop it. Praise God. And when we walk according to the will of God, amen, his will will be done and his protection will be there. Amen. So, but many of these Jews are already at this funeral service. The same ones that want to stone Jesus. They're already there. These, these people are not happy with Jesus the most, for the most part. They're very frustrated with him because he's changing everything. He, because he's telling the truth. Do, do you realize that? You know one of the things that I've learned of being a preacher? And I'm not going to apologize for it anymore. People sometimes just don't like to hear the truth. Amen. Yeah, it could be partly my personality. Oh, but you come across too hard. It might be that, but God made me the way that he made me. And I pray, Lord, please change me if I'm getting in the way of you. And I believe that God is changing me. But at the same time, you don't even have to have a harsh personality. Sometimes when you just read the straight up truth off the pages, it begins to convict. It begins to, to, to minister to the heart and to tell someone when they're not right, the things in their life that aren't right. And people don't like the way that feels. People don't like to be told that things aren't right in their life. The preacher don't like to be told or corrected. But the reality of it is, is that the word of God constantly corrects us for Amen. our own good. What kind of father would not correct his child? Amen. We had fathers in the physical that would correct us and chastise us for, for our better. How much more our loving father would bring correction in our lives. Amen. Amen. So these Jews, though, they're, they're against Jesus, and that's the context of where he is. And it says, let's go to verse 22. No, I'm sorry, verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said unto her, your brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believe this? Do you believe this? She said unto him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God which should come into the world. Now, I know that I do a lot of teaching in this church, and many of you probably are aware of this. And so if you, if you already know, then you know, don't get frustrated with me for being repetitive. But the word Christ has very spirit, a lot of spiritual significance. It's actually a title. If you looked at it in the Greek, it would have the word the in front of it in the Greek. It's, it means the anointed one. That's what the word Christ means. What you need to understand is, is that God's had the same plan from the beginning to the end. His plan right after the fall was to bring the anointed one upon the earth. He began to proclaim it immediately after the fall. He told the serpent, the seed of the woman, 
the anointed one, the Christ, will crush your head. Amen. And, and from that day moving forward, he has progressively prepared the way. He said it'd be this, not just the seed of the woman, but the seed of Abraham. Not just the seed of Abraham, but the seed of Judah. Not just the seed of Judah, but the seed of David. And the word that spoke the world into existence became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Hallelujah. And then he took upon himself the guilt and the penalty of sin that would belong to mankind. And he went and he hung naked on a cross and he paid that penalty. Hallelujah. And it allowed you and I to gain the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it allowed you and I to have access to grace which will change our lives. Amen. She says, yes, Lord, I believe you're the one. See, for you and I, that might be a hard thing for us to understand, but for the Jewish mind, they've been waiting. <laughs> they've been waiting for him to show up. Zacharias said that he that he would come riding in on a donkey. He hadn't done that yet in this story. But 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 that, and that, you know the word of God says one day he's coming back on a white horse. But throughout the scriptures, the Jewish people were being prepared to receive the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. And she says, I believe that you are that one. I may not understand all this resurrection business. I might not understand exactly what you're trying to say, but I do believe that you are the one that we have been waiting for. She says, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now, I got to listen to me, and this is not my message this morning, but do you know that there's still a whole lot of people that are still waiting for the, for the one to show up? Amen. I, I'm, I'm not here to pick on anybody, but I'm here to tell you the Muslims are still waiting on their body. They don't believe it's Jesus. I had a conversation with a lady the other day in the clinic. She was wearing her, the burqa. She, I don't know how it opened up, but what, she wanted to talk. So I said, well, we're going to talk. And she said, I feel so much peace right now. Where is your place? I'd like to go pray in Egypt. We all just pray together. I'm like, man, look, this is the, this is the thing. You're welcome to come. I, all are welcome. But I got to tell you something right now. Islam teaches that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Islam doesn't teach that Jesus was deity or that he was God. And so the problem that we have here is, is that if you were be able to commu have communion with other Christians and that, and that preached to Jesus and did not delineate who the real Jesus is, the word of God teaches that it was another Jesus. You can't have the name of Jesus and not have the fact that Jesus died on the cross because without that Jesus, we don't have redemption. And I began to explain to her the whole of the gospel and connect the points that she would believe from her Bible and, and explain to you even what I just said, that in the beginning, God said that the seed of the woman was going to crush the head of the serpent and that there was a promised seed and his name was Isaac. And she began to say, oh my gosh, I think I can see certain things. I don't know if she's still feeling that way or not. Right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, touch her. Yes. Yes. Minister to her. Yes. Strengthen her, Lord God, and allow your spirit to reveal to her your truth. Yes, Lord. Amen. It's got to be the right Jesus. Amen. And he's the, and not only are, are, the, are the Muslims waiting for the body to show back up, but the New Agers are, are still are waiting for, the, he's an avatar. He's the, he's the last avatar. They said Jesus was an avatar. Look, I, you don't even want to waste your time reading all that stuff. I did it for you. I'm just telling you some weird stuff out there. And everybody's waiting for something. And he's going to show up. Yes, Lord. He, that dude that they waiting for is going to show up. But he ain't going to be the one that they expected because they rejected the one. Hallelujah. That God sent. And because they chose to believe a lie, God is going to allow them to have what it is that they desire. Amen. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. They chose to believe a lie. So with great and strong delusion. He's going to allow this other one to perform miracles, to call fire down from the sky. I'm here to tell you, though, that she had a revelation. This one here is the Christ. Don't listen to me. Don't don't fall into the trap. Amen. Amen. Jesus Amen. is the one. Yeah. All right. So let's go to verse 32 through 45. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if you had been here uh, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, that says exactly what it says. He was groaning because there was commotion that was going on in him. See, you, you, we forget the humanity of Christ. 
He felt what he felt something in the spirit that wasn't right. He's listen. There's a bunch of troublemakers in this crowd. You ever tried to you ever try to talk about Jesus or even, you know when there's troublemakers around? Mm -hmm. Amen. When there's a troublemaker around, you can feel it in your spirit. There's a tension. Sometimes you can feel the tension. You can cut it with a knife. He knows there's tension in the crowd. These people wanted to stone me last week. He says, um, and said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Yes, he could have. But for your good. He waited a couple more days because he needed you to be able to see something so that you also would be able to believe. Because even though right now you're causing turmoil and you're causing chaos in the midst of what God's trying to do, even still Jesus died for you. Amen. So that you could also have grace. That's an important word for you and I to remember because many times there's going to be people in our lives that are going to be causing conflict. And they're going to come against us. And sometimes they're believers. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Have you not ever caused conflict in somebody else's life? If we're real with one another. Even after you knew the Lord. Even after you loved Jesus. Have you not ever caused frustration and conflict in somebody else's life? Can you look back at a time? I'm not, let's not spend too much time here. But can you not look back at a time and realize, you know what? I believe that the, that the enemy used me more than the Lord did in that Amen. situation. I don't know about you, but I know for a fact that if I'm honest with you, that has definitely happened to me Amen. as a believer. Amen. And so here they are, they're causing all kind of commotion. Jesus, it says right here, could not this man have opened the eyes of the blind and given this man that he should not have died? And Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, says unto him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he has been dead four days. Jesus says unto her, said I not unto you that if you would believe you should see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus says unto them, loose him and let him go. And then many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen these things which Jesus did. They believed on him. They saw this miracle and they too believed on him. The same ones. Look at That's what it says. Then many of the Jews which had come to Mary. So they knew Mary. See the acquaintances that you have out there in the real world. They know you. They may not know Jesus, but they know you. Amen. And, and, and there's a connection to the, between y'all two. And there's a possibility that that connection will lead them to Christ. But these same ones that are causing commotion in the crowd, some of these same ones that had the spirit of Antichrist on them that wanted to stone Jesus, are now seeing this miracle taking place. The resurrection of someone that was dead, that came to life, and now that they see this, they also Ended up believing on him. You know, I, just for a second though, I'm not trying to be funny, but good thing you can't see the back of this pulpit. I'm not trying to be funny, but I want to make a point. And you got to try to sometimes turn the scriptures into like a little bit of a picture show so that you could imagine. Now, you know, the, the Jewish people learned the art of embalming from the Egyptians. And we know that the Egyptians created those monkey, uh, monkeys, <laughs> mummies. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> created the mummies, the concept of the mummy. They, they put spices on them to preserve the body and they'd wrapped in. So I want you to see this word of God says right here that he was, he was wrapped up and bound in grave clothes. He had a napkin on his face. <laughs> and I don't know exactly what it looked like. And I'm not trying to really be funny. I know sometimes I try to make you laugh, but I'm being serious. When he came out, I don't know exactly what it looked like, but I imagine it looked something like this. He had a napkin over his face so he couldn't see. That's what the Word of God says right there. He had something covering his face, 
and he was all wrapped up, so I'm imagining that he comes hopping out like that, some kind of way like that. He can't move properly. I don't know if his arms are also connected to his body or if his arms are free. I'm not real sure. But I imagine whatever it is, he's encumbered. He's, he's, he's hindered from being able to move properly. He can't see right. And I just want you to get a picture of that, and we're going to get into that a little bit more. Now we're going to transition. This is the last passage that I'm going to read to you, and then we're going to start preaching. You ready? All right. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. This is after Lazarus has been resurrected. And this is six days before Jesus is going to be crucified. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, it was very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Much of the people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. Knew that Jesus was at the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus. Also, whom he had raised from the dead. And I just wanted you to see that part there, that the effect that this miracle had in Lazarus' life began to draw attention and people began to come to see the one whom had been previously dead and now had been brought back to life. So again, the title of my message is Identify Yourself. How did I get that title out of this message? I'm going to explain it to you. See, the word identity can have many meanings. One of, the, one of the meanings is the condition of being oneself or itself and not another person. My identity is that I'm Matthew James Abair. Identity can also be the condition or character as to a, who a person or what a thing is. The qualities, the beliefs. That, that is contained within a person. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Who is your identity? Identify yourself. Who do you associate yourself to be? Who do you think you are? Who do you see yourself as who you are? Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Or the word identity can mean exact likeness in nature or qualities. In some way, shape, or form, all of these things are interconnected to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the title's meaning has to do with the way that resurrection changes the identity of Lazarus. The Bible teaches that believers receive a new identity when they get saved. That identity is made possible because of the resurrection power that is given to those that believe and surrender to the will of God. See, many times people are like, man, I still don't understand what you're trying to say. I've had conversations with people through the years. I don't understand what you mean by the message of the cross. I don't understand what this is supposed to mean. And, and you know, I've been sitting here and I've been listening to what you're trying to say. We're going to get into it a little bit here this morning. But let me just say this. There's a, there's a point to this, this gospel message. And a big point to it is this. Is your willingness to cooperate with the Holy Spirit according to his will. See, the word of God says that Jesus died, he gave, he breathed his last breath, and he said, it is finished. And Jesus has made the way for you and I to have access to grace. And grace is the power of God from the Holy Ghost that will move in your life and change you. Hallelujah. You can't change yourself, but the Holy Spirit will change you. But the question is, will you allow the key to be turned that says, okay, but will you cooperate? Yes, with my will. Will you surrender your life unto me? Will you allow your identity to be swallowed up in me? Or will you fight to hold on to who you are, who you were in your first birth? Is that who you want to continue to be in your and throughout your whole existence upon the earth? You want to hold on to your Adamic nature? You want to hold on to the personality or the person that you were that was 
was born in the physical when you gush forth in water from your mother's womb? Or do you want to allow Adam to die? Amen. Will you cooperate with the Holy Spirit and allow Adam to die? Amen. Because, see, God wants to bring a resurrection life. So how you identify yourself is your identity. How do you identify yourself? Is it intertwined with your old life and your old ways? Or is your identity intertwined with your new life that was given resurrection through Jesus? You know, in the beginning of the story, Lazarus' identity was associated with his sister. I don't know if you noticed that or not. He was the brother of Mary who anointed the Lord and washed his feet with her hair. But after he's resurrected from the, the dead, the Bible refers to him this way. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. There's a change that takes place. See, everybody might have known you the previously the way that you used to be and who you were interconnected with. I can remember one time my dad, I told him, I said, Dad, I went to, I don't remember where we were. We were in Lafayette. I was like, man, I just went to a uh, wedding two days ago. And this guy told me that he went to UL, or back then it was called SLI. And he asked, I said, well, yeah, well, my daddy played football over there. He was like, well, what, what was your daddy's name? And I told him, and he said, yeah, your daddy slapped me one time. <laughs> He's like, boy, I told you not to tell nobody who your daddy was. I was a troublemaker. You're not going to get nowhere in life. But what, what my point is, is that people's identity many times is connected to their physical birth or connected to the person that they used to be. Amen. Whoever you were in your previous life, I'm here to tell you that if you're born again, that is not who you are today. Amen. So you need to quit hanging on to that. And we, and we all need to quit making excuses mm -hmm. for that. Yes, Lord. Oh yeah, there's still an old nature. Yeah, there's still sin. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is more powerful than the power of sin. And Jesus has already broke the curse of death, hell, and the grave. And he wants to give us the victory through resurrection power. Amen. The last part of that story has been magnified in my mind. Jesus did a miracle in Lazarus' life. He was dead and was made alive. The news about his resurrection spread and it caused others to take interest in what happened. That's what God wants to do in your life. That's what God wants to do in my life. Amen. I don't, praise God. Some people are not going to allow you to live that down. That is the devil. That is demonic. Somebody that brings up your past whenever you're over here obviously desiring to live for God. Is everything perfect in your life? Of course not. And it's not perfect in the person's life that's accusing you either. And if they don't want to allow you to let go of your past so that you can move on with Jesus, Lord, help them. Pray for them that the Lord would reveal to them in their own heart and in their own life that they got a plank in their eye as they're looking to get the little husk of weed out of your eye. Amen. Lord, help us. A bunch of, a bunch of religious hypocrites. Amen. We, we think that we're so much better than other people. We think we're so much more spiritual than other people. Don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought is what the scripture says. Amen. This is exactly how the gospel has spread. See, Jesus did a miracle in Lazarus' life. It changed him. Amen. And in a spiritual sense, this is exactly how the gospel has spread for the last thousands of years. How? The, the gospel, which means good news, has gone forth. People surrender to it and believe it. A resurrection miracle. I'm about to get to it in a second. Hold on. A resurrection miracle takes place in their life. And now everybody got to come and see this. Mm -hmm. or, or everybody got to hear this. Mm -hmm. The story is broadcast. You remember so-and-so? Do you remember how so-and-so used to be? You ain't going to believe this, man. God done got a hold of that person and, and has changed them. I don't know about you, but that's how I want it. That's, the, that's what I want the story of Matt Abair to be. Amen. Matt Abair needs to cooperate with the Holy Ghost and allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in his life. Amen? Amen. They believe that's what happens. See, people are born physically dead in the bondage of sin. They hear the gospel of Jesus. They believe and spiritually they are identified in God's mind with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The Father now sees them as righteous. And those believers now have access to grace, which is power from the Holy Spirit to be changed, to be given a new identity in Christ. 
I need you to understand that. See, most times people get so caught up in the word grace and they think it only means forgiveness or they think that it only means, oh, I messed up and so now I can be free. Yes, God, you can, you, God's going to keep on forgiving you. Amen? Because he loves you. And that doesn't mean your conscience can't get seared. It doesn't mean that you can, your heart can't become hard towards God. That's not what I'm saying. It's not, I'm not even saying that you can't lose your salvation. Lord, help me. I ain't got time to get into that right now. Amen. I'm here to tell you right now that there's a whole lot of people that think they're all right with the Lord. And, and in reality, they're probably not. Amen. Lord, help us yes, Lord. that we would be able to see. Yes, but what I'm trying to say is this, is that the word grace, literally the definition in the Greek dictionary says this. That it's a divine, that means God, influence on the heart, the inner man, and it's reflected change in the life. That means whenever the grace of God begins to minister to you, he begins to change you inwardly. He begins to touch spots that you can't touch, my friend. He begins to touch spots that the psychiatrist can't touch, my friend. He begins to touch spots that medication created by science cannot touch because he is the author of your life and he's got the copyright on your soul and he begins to touch things on the inside and change things to where it becomes manifest on the outside. People are going to start to see it. The people that know you the best will start to see it. Yes, Lord. On the surface, this miracle was deliberate and extremely important to strengthen people's faith. He said, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. He said, and the, the crowd said, could this man have not healed, caused him not to die? I mean, he's opened the eyes of the blind and Jesus is groaning in himself. And But Jesus did allow all that to happen for a purpose because look, he's about to go to the cross. He's about to go to the cross and die and then he's going to resurrect and he wants people to be prepared to be able to believe. He wants people to understand that he is the resurrection in the life. Amen. But I'm digging a little bit deeper because I'm going in a more spiritual sense. I'm making a spiritual connection. I'm talking about the fact that belief in God and his ways isn't supposed to just be some get out of hell free card. Amen. But instead it's the beginning of access to a new identity. Salvation in Christ is the beginning of a new journey, a new pathway to a new power called resurrection life. It's difficult at times for any of us to trust God in faith with reference to what he's asking us to do. What is he asking you to do? I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about, oh, go preach the gospel in India. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in your personal life, what has God been dealing with you about? What has God been speaking to you about? Many times those things that we try to hold on to and we don't want to let go of. And we don't want to let go of them, right? And, and so it's difficult for us at times to trust God in faith with reference to what he's asking us to do. It could be said that the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus is literally the gospel of God. And without faith in that, no man will see God. And we don't have to, you can turn there if you want to, but Romans 10, 9 says this, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Believing in the resurrection is essential to our salvation. Amen. Amen. Jesus knew Lazarus would die. He knew by waiting extra time that Lazarus would be really dead. He did that on purpose because he wanted others to see and experience the resurrection power of God. Because he would soon die and resurrect. And in order for a man or woman to be born again from the death of sin, they will have to believe that he is God's solution for sin and death. Amen. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. He, said, he said that he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Just, though he were dead, he that believes on me will live. Have you ever felt dead? I felt like I needed to ask you that question this morning. I know that seems kind of crazy. I'm not talking about whether or not you were real tired or you were so cold. I'm not talking about that. I know, like, you know, if you sleep enough, you might look dead. And you, if you're real cold, sometimes my hands are so cold. Dude, I do that intermittent fast and stuff and my metabolism throttles down and I'm like I'm in the clinic I'm over there okay I got to check these teenagers for lymph nodes and stuff like that because my other job is I'm a nurse practitioner and so I go okay hey look my hands are cold and they're like <laughs> I don't know why my hands get cold like that sometimes like I mean you know I know I've, it's kind of weird to say but I've had to 
touch dead bodies before because I was an ICU nurse. I mean, a lot of to prepare for the family, you know? And so I'm, I've been around a lot of death. Not, not everybody's been around a lot of death. I've seen a lot of death. And so I know what, but it, that's not really what I'm talking about right now. Though. I'm talking about, but have you ever in your life been so bound up in sin or so depressed or so lonely that you really did not feel alive anymore? It's just one day after the other, nothing ever seems to change. I feel like I'm dead on the inside. Have you ever felt that way? You don't have to raise your hand. Hallelujah, brother. Thank you for being honest. Hallelujah, brother. Thank you for being honest back there. Listen to me. I know that it's true that we've all been through dark times. We've all faced negative situations that have made me feel, man, I feel like I'm separated from God. And especially after we've known the Lord and to go walk away from God, then we many times can can feel that separation and that loneliness. loneliness. Jesus rose physically from the dead and there will be a physical resurrection for life to those that die in faith. Amen. Amen. But a huge part of spiritual victory is related to a revelation of the resurrection power that is available to the new man that's been born again in Christ. I don't think that we can say that enough. A huge part of spiritual victory is related to a revelation of the resurrection. I'm about to give you some scripture here in a second, so just hold on. We're preaching this morning. Of the resurrection power that is available to the new man that's been born again in Christ. Did you not hear the good news? I mean, when you got saved, the old man born of Adam died and a new man born again in Jesus resurrected. Didn't you hear that good news? You didn't hear that story. Maybe it's because, uh oh, here we go. This is, when I, this is when the preacher starts stepping on toes. You didn't hear that story. Maybe it's because you've been listening to the wrong message. Or you've been hanging out with the wrong people. Come on, somebody, help me out. You keep on hanging out with people that don't believe the way that you do, and you keep letting them yap in your ear and tell you lies, and you keep listening and looking at stuff that's contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and what is it going to do? It's not going to build up your faith. It's not going to build up your inner man, but instead it's going to slowly begin to begin to erode your faith. Amen. Been hanging out with the wrong people, drinking the wrong stuff, taking the wrong stuff. And you listen to the right story is going to tell you to quit going there, to quit drinking that stuff, to quit taking that stuff, to quit listening to that stuff. Well, I don't want to hear that because your old man is still alive and your new man is being starved. But I'm here to tell you that the gospel says, no, let it go and experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ and let him do what he has come to do in your life. Amen. Amen. See, when you're ready to experience the new life that God is offering, let me tell you, it's waiting for you. Yes, Lord. It's waiting for me. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. The resurrection power of God gives victory over sin. Let's look at these scriptures real quick. Romans 6 and 4. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now we don't have time to teach too deep because I know I'm going a little longer. But we've already taught many times that this isn't talking about water baptism. That when you get saved, when the, the moment you believe on Christ, whether you knew it or not, the Holy Spirit took you, born dead in Adam and born in sin, and baptized you or immersed you into the person of Christ where you became one with Him. This is your new identity I'm talking to you about. Will you be identified with Jesus? He immersed you into Christ where you died with Him, you were buried with Him, and you were resurrected to newness of life. And this is your new identity, child of God. Man. This is the new person that you are. And that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Raised up together. Look at, look, look at Romans 6, 5. Look at this. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's your identity. You've been made one with him. The old man born in Adam has died in Christ. He's been buried together with him. Joint union, joint participation. The old man is dead according to the father's will. In the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
Hallelujah. You're identified with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. And listen, I want to remind you of something. I don't know where my chalk is. Here we go. I want to remind you of something. There's two sides to Calvary. There's a cross side or a death side. You know, the cross is, I say it a lot, and it's a good thing to keep saying. The cross is an instrument of death. The altar, this little wooden ledge right here, is a type of Calvary. Well, I never knew why we were always going to the altar. But you know what you're supposed to go to the altar for? Not, oh, Lord, I got all kind of problems in my life. Yeah, you can go to the Lord when you have problems in your life. But the focus ought not be your problem. The focus ought to be Jesus Christ and what he already did for you. And when you come to the altar, you're supposed to be allowing stuff to be laid down. You're supposed to be allowing stuff to be killed on the inside of your life, to be crucified on the inside of your life. Because there's a death side of Calvary. But there's also a resurrection Life side of Calvary. Hallelujah. I got to tell you right now that listen, those things are part of the old man. Those, those, those things that are part of the old man go to the death side of Calvary and, and God allows them to be crucified in Christ. Hallelujah. But then there's a resurrection side of Calvary where the resurrection power of God begins to be manifest on the inside of your life and that grace I was talking about earlier begins to change stuff on the inside of your heart and begins to change you so deeply that it becomes reflected on the outside of your yes. life. I tell, whenever you get this figured out, you let me know, child of God. Amen. When you when you, when you say, I, I'm there, pre let me check that one off, preacher. It's manifest in my life. Well, you're not the one that has the authority to say that. And don't go ask my wife, but we need to ask your wife. <laughs> we need to ask your husband. Come on, somebody. They the ones that know. No, you can't play games with God. Walk around here like we all holy. Lord, help us. We ain't right. We need you to do a work in our heart. We need the death side of Calvary to kill that thing. And we need resurrection life to be manifest in our life. Amen? Yes, Lord. Amen. Look at this. Romans 8 and 11 through 14. If the spirit of him... That raised up Jesus from the dead would dwell in you. Amen. Amen. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken. That's old King James. Forgive life to your mortal body. You're mortal. You know what? You're a mortal. Yeah, and one day you're going to have a glorified body. Amen. And it's going to be a beautiful Amen. thing. It's going to be a beautiful thing. Oh, hallelujah. You'll be able to walk through walls and still eat. <laughs> Amen. But listen. <laughs> You're immortal. And your mortal has frailty. Let me, let, me, let me not get caught up right here because we're going to talk about frailty in a moment. Just bear with me. But the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also dwell in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. To live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you, through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Do you know that you don't owe a debt to sin anymore? Amen. Oh, no, there was a time whenever you were a debtor to sin because you weren't redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Yes, but I'm here to tell you that, 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 that sin is not your master. Yes, and you don't owe a debt. I, I was thinking about this song, man. And I know I taught I y'all what I got to keep singing, but until we get a new sound system, I'm going to have Danielle with a mic back there. She can sing when I ask her to sing some of them old songs that I used to remember. <laughs> Because sometimes whenever I see these things in the gospel, I'm like, man, I don't know if that's what caused that person to write that song, but I get it now. Hallelujah. The song that I was thinking of, it says something like this. Don't laugh at me. I owed a debt. Jesus paid. How'd it go? How's it go? Yeah, but how's it start? What's the first? What comes first? I owed a debt. I owe, I owed a debt. I could not pay. He, no, he paid, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. My Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. I got good news for you, church. You don't owe sin a debt, my friend. He paid a debt that he didn't know. You owed a debt that you couldn't pay, but hallelujah, he paid the debt, and you no longer have to be a servant of sin. You and I can say no, and we can experience
experience resurrection life, hallelujah, we can receive a new identity in Christ. Yes, Lord. So if you're listening to me this morning, and you're thinking, I need some resurrection life. I need a new identity. I need to leave this place and start living in a new place. The first thing that I want you to know is this. You ready for point number one? Here we go. He's here to help. I got to tell you that wherever you are and whatever you're going through, Jesus is here to help. Hallelujah. Where it said a certain man was sick, his name was Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. God wants you to know that wherever you are, whatever you're into, no matter how bad it is, he is here to help. It just don't get no better than this. The name Lazarus means whom God helps. Let me say that one more time. The name Lazarus means whom God helps. Lazarus needed some help, church. And Jesus showed up to give him what it was that he needed. Hallelujah. Lazarus had a sickness that caused death. That word sickness can mean malady. It can mean infirmity. It can mean disease. But you know what? It can also mean moral frailty. What it means at its heart is weakness. Mankind is weak. Mankind cannot fix himself. Mankind cannot save himself. But you and I are Lazarus. And we are the one whom God helps. And we are Lazarus because we got a weakness from our first birth in Adam when we were born of sin. But hallelujah, God has sent Jesus here to help us. Amen. There's sinful areas in people's lives. And those things are too powerful to overcome in our own strength. We aren't told what his sickness was, but the word used once again describes weakness. Do you feel frail in any areas of your life? If there's areas of your life where you feel frail and too weak to battle, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is here to help. Amen. I don't really know of a better illustration, but I know that I was thinking, I remembered a couple of times whenever I was doing that jujitsu stuff. I definitely ain't wanting to get all close to nobody right now like that. But when I was doing all that, we would kind of do this whole MMA sparring thing. I can just remember it will physically fatigue you. I'm just here to tell you. Look, I'm not getting weird on you. I'm not trying to talk about fighting. I'm just trying to use this as an illustration. All right? And unless you got the first lick on somebody and you tap them on the chin and they go to sleep, if you get in a fight and, and there's a bunch of rumbling going on and there's a whole bunch of going back and forth and you're not prepared, your body's not prepared for that, you will be sapped of your energy. And at some point in time, I'm telling you right now, especially with some big old dude that's bigger than you and weighs more than you on top of you and he's got position on you and you, he's just sucking the life out of you. And you're sitting over there trying to fight it and fight it and all your energy is being zapped out of you at some point in time, I'm going to tell you right now. And I can remember the instructor saying, don't you ever do that again. Mm -hmm. I saw him tell somebody, don't you ever tap again because you're tired, because you're fatigued and you would rather just quit. And I'm here to tell you that sometimes life has a way of doing that. You feel so weak because of life that you just give in. But I'm here to tell you that's not God's will. It's not God's will for us to give in. Amen. I'm here to tell you that he is here to give us the strength that we need. Amen. Praise God. Second thing I want you to see is it's so close. You know, many times we need the help of God. And it feels so far away because we've been dealing with it for so long and we're getting so tired. But I'm here to tell you, it's so close. And what I'm talking about right now is this. Lazarus was from a town called Bethany. You know what the word Bethany means? It means house of misery. Lazarus was from a place called house of misery, but it was only 1.8 miles from Jerusalem, which means, which is the word shalom and means peace. The house of misery was only was less than two miles away from the place of peace. And I'm here to tell you that many times we're going through things and we've been fighting and we're feeling weak and we're feeling fatigued. But God would say, you're right there. You're right there. Don't let the devil have his way. Don't let the devil keep stealing your peace. Hold on to me. Keep trusting in me and come to me. Because my question for you this morning is, do you believe that God can get you from point A to point B? Yes, do you believe that God can bring you from Bethany to Jerusalem? Do you believe that he can do the work in your life that no matter what you're facing? Amen. So don't let fatigue overwhelm you. Don't let the weakness of the flesh overwhelm you. Hold on to Jesus and trust that God is going to get you through. Amen. 
This is the last thing I wanted to talk to you about. It's not just living, but loosed. What I'm saying is, is that whenever Lazarus woke up out of that tomb, the Lord said, Lazarus, come forth. He had a napkin over his face and his body was bound, but that wasn't good enough. That was just the beginning of the miracle that Jesus was here to perform. He come, he might have come out there hopping. I don't know for sure. He might have come out there hobbling. I don't know for sure. But I know one thing. God did not intend, Jesus did not intend for him to continue living like that. And I'm here to tell you that God does not intend. If you are truly a child of God this morning. If you are truly born again from the dead, I'm here to tell you it is not God's intent for you to stay bound up and wrapped up like a mummy with a napkin over your face. Hallelujah. Where you can't see spiritual things. Where you can't see what God's wanting to do in your life. Where you can't walk right and you can't function right. No. God wants to deliver you and set you free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.